Hello and welcome back to the Agenda Podcast here on the Blood Red channel. I'm your host, Edward K, and I'm joined today by the Echo's very own Theo Squires. And we're going to be looking a bit back to uh, the Everton win on Monday night. And then we're going to be looking forward to the Newcastle game, half five on Saturday. Uh, we're going to start by just talking about, I mean, the mood around the club, Theo. It's amazing what a couple of returns from injury and a derby win can do. You know, it was all doom and gloom before. And now it seems like, you know, there's a bit, bit of hope around the club, doesn't there? Yeah, it does. Um, it's one where Liverpool needed a win. They needed a response as well. It couldn't be just an unconvincing victory. You wanted to see him show up against Everton and actually say there is still something about us here. And that's exactly what they demonstrated. And I think it's one where fans have looked at the league table for the first time in God knows how long. And suddenly the top four doesn't see so unreachable. Granted, it's still a big ask. But when you're going to Newcastle or in that fourth spot at the weekend, you get a win. You've got a couple of games in hand. You know, Newcastle are going to miss a week in a couple of weeks because of the League Cup final. There's opportunities there to make up ground, to make it a fight again. And when you think of Liverpool of old, even when 2020-2021 wasn't going their way, they managed to find a way to get back in the top four at the end of the season. And it was just about getting a run of results going and putting it together, players coming back from injury. And you can see the similarities now. If the Everton game can act as the first game in a, a run for the next two or three months, there's reasons to be positive. There's players coming back from injury. And Liverpool can rescue this season. But there's still this, I suppose, caution around it because we have seen before in the first half of the season more than so than the second, where it seems Liverpool would turn a corner and then they'd just be straight back to square one with the next poor performance. But with the way these fixtures are coming up, when you know Real Madrid you're going to play twice before the March international break, you've got Manchester United in there, you've got Newcastle in there, just had Everton. These are games which they can give you momentum, they can give you confidence. If uh, Liverpool can get a bit of life back, show us what they're about from yesteryear, show us the form that they've showed in previous seasons and convince us once and for all that this season is just a blip, there's a reason to be positive off the back of the derby. Yeah, hopefully they can convince us that this is the sort of turning point in the season. Uh, you mentioned there have been you know, a few of them, especially in the early parts of the season, beating Man City 1-0 and then following up. I think that was, we followed that up with the Nottingham Forest loss and the Leeds yeah. loss, didn't we? So, you know, hopefully not a similar situation. But we mentioned the, the injury boost Liverpool have been given recently. Obviously, throughout the season, it's been pretty negative news injury-wise. But now Jota and Firmino back on the pitch. Virgil van Dijk was seen warming up as well, all smiles. How important is that going to be for the Reds, you know, with the difficult running that they've got coming up? It's a difficult one to really say at the moment because they've had so many injuries this year, but it doesn't feel like in last year, uh, previous years where you can use it as an excuse to the same extent. Like when we talk about 2020, 2021, they lost all their senior centre-backs and they started playing midfielders at centre-back and then they had to rely on the kids. That, that was an obvious hole in the team. That was why they weren't getting the results. Whereas this year, they're not getting the results and they've had the injuries, but they've still been able to put together an 11 in their, their proper positions. It hasn't sent like, the same sort of weakness. But you'd say the front three, uh, it's new players trying to come to terms with their team and it's a struggling team. And maybe Liverpool have lost, lost that little bit of familiarity, whereas if they'd had a, a Jota or a Firmino in the front three, things would have been better these last few months because it's only one new player in there. You can find a bit of rhythm and you're letting players bed in slowly. Like It's been forgotten. You think of Fabinho, Andy Robertson, Oxlade Chamberlain. These players, they took time to settle in at Liverpool. It wasn't an immediate success. And just because Luis Diaz came in last year and hit the ground running, everyone thinks, oh, this is what we can expect now. Well, no, it takes time. And players took time in a very good Liverpool team. Never mind this struggling Liverpool team. But you think it's a, a boost to the squad still. Like you, They've needed reinforcements. They've needed the cavalry to arrive. They didn't get it in the field with the new signings, but they've got some familiar, familiarity with these players coming back. Jota is a boost, but at the same time, he is a player who has suffered a couple of injuries this year, suffered a couple of setbacks this year, and hasn't scored for Liverpool in 10 months. Firmino he had a good first half of the season. He was scoring goals, but still, he's a player who's ageing. He's getting injuries a bit more out of contract in the summer. That's a point to prove. And Van Dijk, he hasn't been the Van Dijk we've known in the past. He's not hit the same levels. Maybe this month on the sidelines is just what he needs is off the back of the World Cup and he can re rediscover top form. 
But this is what I'm saying, and the fact that it can go either way for these players. Jota can come in, be hungry to make up for lost time, and go straight back to scoring his, what, 20 goals he got last season. Firmino, points prove, gets his new contract. Van Dijk, he's had a rest, admittedly, through rehab, and he's back to his best. Or it's players who have had injuries before, haven't been at their best before, and they're going to have injuries again, not be at their best again. It's a, a difficult time to be coming back into a Liverpool starting eleven. The players have got to hit top form. The pressure is on them now. Uh, it does, on paper, give them the boost. It puts smiles on faces. You're happy to see them back in the full shirts. We saw the, the reception all three were getting, warming up and coming on. But they need to deliver on the pitch. And we'll, we'll see that against Newcastle, against Real Madrid and this run coming up. But when it is such a big run coming up, it is also a gamble to put them straight back in the start at 11 when these these are lengthy layoffs. It's not as though it's someone who's only been out for a couple of weeks. Jota's not kicked a ball since October. Firmino, we haven't seen him since uh, the mid-season tour to Dubai. Van Dijk, it's what, over a month? Uh, got to strike carefully with them on paper. It is great news for Liverpool, but you wouldn't think say they're around the corner just yet. Yeah, Van Dijk, the, uh, the shortest layoff of those three by by some way and obviously he'll probably be of the three the one to come straight back into the starting lineup and there was there was a lot of talk obviously with him being out of Nat Phillips maybe coming in before the derby after Matip yeah. and Gomez obviously didn't cover themselves in glory in that 3-0 loss against Wolves so how valuable a clean sheet do you think that'll prove for that centre-back pairing and their confidence? Um, I think it is vital like Liverpool have conceded so many silly early goals, opening goals. It's a boost when you do get a clean sheet. And we were just saying on the desk earlier, imagine how differently that game goes if Tarkowski's header goes in, Liverpool have conceded first yet again, and then you've got the Anfield crowd. Do they get on the players' backs? Are they frustrated? Or do they get behind them in their group? Thankfully, we don't need to really worry about that because Liverpool put in this Liverpool of old goal on the counter-attack with Nunes covering the whole pitch pretty much and cutting him open. But that's how fragile Liverpool are at the moment, where if you concede an opening goal, you don't have any faith in them getting the two to win a game. It's big ask for them to just get a draw. Um, you need them to show that bit more fighting spirit, which is what we saw in the derby, to be fair. They did get stuck in. They did look like the better team for the majority of it. Uh, it's one where getting the clean sheet, it's a big boost. It's what you want. You want your goalkeeper to not have to pick the ball out the back of the net. It gives you that starter point. Like you can win a game. 1-0, you can lose a game 1-0. If you concede in a silly goals, it's an uphill battle. But if you've got a clean sheet, you've always given yourself a chance, no matter how well or badly you're playing. Like Liverpool won a Premier League title by winning games by the odd goal and getting these late victories. But we're not quite at those level of mentality monsters yet. A clean sheet is the start. Now you've just got to make it one clean sheet into two, two into three. There was a faint shine of it, um, I think, Around the Man City win, because they got the clean sheet against uh, West Ham afterwards. There might have been a Champions League one around then as well against Ajax. We'll have to look back at the fixtures. completely matched up. But there was a point there where Liverpool were getting a few clean sheets in order. And we thought, oh, that could be a turning point. And then, as you've already mentioned, Forest and Leeds happened and it was straight back to square one. This is just one clean sheet. It's just one victory. But it is that starting point where you can go on another run. And hopefully we're not going to have any more rock bottoms around the corner. This is Liverpool revived on the way back up. Yeah, and a big helper towards that clean sheet and the victory was the performance of 18-year-old Stefan Bajsetic in central midfield. Obviously, him after the game, um, when he'd been given the man of the match, was speaking about the fact he was playing a position he's, he's not necessarily used to. Jurgen Klopp mentioned that in his post-game press conference as well as and that's, I think, just another sign of you know the maturity of him. He's, he's shown wisdom beyond his years in that Liverpool midfield. And how much of a bonus has his emergence since sort of the World Cup break been to Liverpool this season? And how long do you see him holding his place in the starting eleven? It's been a, a massive, massive blessing. Like, can you imagine how much worse the midfield would be if we hadn't had him in the last few weeks? Um, I, I still don't want to put too much pressure on him because he is still only eighteen. There is going to be a drop off in form at some point. Like we've seen Curtis Jones and Harvey Elliott get into the team and then there's been a bit of a decline. And they were still a little bit older than him. Like he is obviously a very talented player. He's not let Liverpool down at all and he's looked good when he's been a number six and when he's been a number eight. But if you're putting him straight in the team and you're saying your first choice from now on, you're going to have to be a pretty world-class talent. I'm not saying he can't be, but it's still very early days in his career. Um, he's one where... If Liverpool's midfield wasn't playing so badly this season, if Fabinho was still 
at his previous levels, if Jordan Hendon was still at his previous levels, Setic isn't getting anywhere near that starting eleven. You'd have him on the bench for the odd game. He'll come on as sub, say Liverpool winning 2-3-0. Oh, we'll bring him on, get him some minutes. Um, and it's like gradually easing him in. Kind of like what they've done with Bobby Clark. They've only turned to him because they've absolutely had to. And it's just, thank goodness that he's risen to the occasion and it's not finished him off and destroyed his confidence. Um, but it, through all these games where Liverpool have been struggling, he has been the shining light. He is the one you can say, yeah, I'm proud to watch him in a Liverpool shirt. He's fighting for it and you can see him as part of the future. He's such a, a likeable lad as well. When he does his interviews, he seems so down to earth, so modest um, and just a normal little um, normal teenager. He, he was exactly the same when we spoke to him in the, the mix zone uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think it was after the Chelsea game. And he's just, you, you know, when you can think, oh, yeah, you, you want to see these players do well. And he's one of them. Um, it's still a long way for him to go in his Liverpool career. I, I would argue that if he is still first choice come May, then the next few months probably haven't gone to plan for Liverpool. Like You want to see Fabinho and Henderson getting back to top form. You want to see Thiago back from injury. You want to see these other senior players getting in ahead of him. But at the moment, he deserves his place as a starting midfielder. He deserves to be top of that pecking order. And he's got a big future ahead of him. He's got a bright future ahead of him. When we talk about the Liverpool revamp, you'd expect him to sign two, three midfielders in the summer. He probably won't get as many starting opportunities off the back of that. But he has come on leaps and bounds. It's, he's made more of an impact than Tyler Morton did last year. And all that praise we gave Tyler Morton, he went out on load. Maybe there's a future loan in it for Pesetic, or he has done enough to be this first choice midfielder, squad player for Liverpool. What what has worked in his favour is he's a he's a number six, so that there isn't really any alternative to Fabinho or Henderson with the legs going. If you want Henderson as a number eight or anything, and he's come and he's grabbed the opportunity. So we want to see more of the same. Fingers crossed, he's going to just keep getting better and better. Um, coming into a Merseyside derby and putting in performance like that, it's not an easy thing for anyone to do, never mind a teenager. And he's delivered exactly that. He deserves all the praise coming his way. But let's not get carried away just yet. Let's not uh, get on his back too much when there's a, a wayward passing or the performances do drop off. It's all a roller coaster, isn't it, for these young players. It'll be a good few years yet before we're seeing him as first choice for Liverpool week in, week out, the very best of him. Yeah, I think there was a, a bit of debate going into the derby about whether, obviously on form, he had to be in that midfield. But there were some people saying, you know, he's, he's young, it's a derby. Will he be able to, uh, you know, keep his head? But I think it was just another tick in that maturity beyond his years box in the performance that he put in. But you mentioned earlier, obviously, a lot of players when they come to Liverpool do take a bit of time to settle in. Sometimes that's, you know, not being introduced into the side yet or... Maybe they might not put in the best performances straight away. Cody Gakpo finally grabbed that debut goal. I'm, I'm not sure he'll have scored many easier in his footballing career. But um, finally breaking that scoring duck, how good would it be if Liverpool can start to, you know, get him firing ahead of, uh, you know, Newcastle coming up, Real Madrid? Is that or is that as crucial with a couple of attackers now returning, you know, Firmino coming back in, Jota, Diaz hopefully returning soon? Um, as it stands... You are relying on Gakpo to perform and put in goals. As I said earlier, there is no guarantees that Jota is going to get back to his best straight away or Firmino, that there could be other injury setbacks just around the corner because these are repeated layoffs that these players have had. And you need to give them the time to get back to their best. Uh, the only thing they've got in their favour is they know this Liverpool team back to front, so they've got that familiarity with it. So you've got that faith in putting them in the starting eleven, and you could take Gakpo out of the firing line and let him just get up to pace on his own terms and gel it with his uh, teammates. But at the same time, he's got his goal against the Dar against Everton in the derby, and he looked so much more confident just off the back of that goal. Uh, we've seen glimpses of him so far. I think it, was it in the Brighton the Cup game where oh we can see him why Liverpool are playing him in that central role? It's one where Liverpool side him, and you think why they don't necessarily need another forward. They don't have as many forwards as they had last year when they nearly won everything, but they've got Jota who can play on the left, they've got Diaz who can play on the left, and they've got Nunes. Do they need another one? Especially when you could have signed a midfielder instead. Then they actually get him in, you're thinking, you spent £65 million on a striker and you're playing him on the left so you can play a winger down the middle. Again, why? It doesn't really make sense. And then results aren't happening, the team's not clicking, and it's just more and more pressure. But they're sticking with it. We've had a few games now with Nunes on the left, Gakpo on the centre. And this was the first time where we've seen those real relationships between the front three where it's starting to work. 
I don't want to say it's only Everton, but we can't get to carried away just yet. But they've got the starting shirts at the moment. It would be much more beneficial for Liverpool if Gakpo starts against Newcastle and scores, or Newcastle um, Nunes starts and scores, and you don't have to put Jota straight in. And then you can take the time. And then we're back to, oh, you've got five, six quality forwards here. You can rotate between them. You can put whoever's freshest in, whoever's hungry for goals. And there isn't necessarily this first choice front three. And with Diaz, he's the one you've got to have the biggest, I suppose, care with as well. Because it's a knee injury he came back from immediately. Oh, it doesn't feel right. Goes and has surgery. I know he's been speaking about, oh, he hopes he's back for the Bernabeu. But we saw last year with the Champions League final, they rushed back Fabinho, they rushed back Salah, they rushed back Van Dijk. Thiago had uh, pain-killing injections. None of them were at their levels and Liverpool just weren't there. You, you can't rely on players who are half fit just because of their name and their reputation. You need the players who are fit, who are already putting in performances and on form. And hopefully in the weeks ahead, that is exactly what Cody Gakpo can provide. Because if he is doing that as a starting point, then the players back from injury is complementing that. And then there's the competition it just goes more positive. There's more for the clock to work with. There's more for the players to work with. But as it stands, it's still very fragile for Liverpool when you've got players who are trying to find a bit of form, trying to gel in with the rest of the team. Yeah, we'll, we'll look ahead to Newcastle now. Obviously, you mentioned the gap between them and Liverpool earlier. They're nine points ahead in fourth. Liverpool with a game in hand, though. If, if the Reds can come away with a win from St James's Park, they're right back in the hunt for the Champions League places, aren't they, really? They are. The only concern is there are so many teams ahead of them at the moment as well. Like, you're relying on a few of them to drop points, so it's not in Liverpool's hands. Realistically, looking at that table, Brighton aren't going to be in Champions League contention. Fulham aren't going to be in Champions League contention. Brentford aren't going to be in Champions League contention. All due respect to them, the good sides, they play good football, but the squads aren't strong enough. What we're used to in English football... Nine times out of ten, the big six are going to finish in the big six. And now it's a big seven with Newcastle. With Newcastle, there is that distraction of the League Cup final. So you'd, it's understandable why they're maybe drawing two more games now or they're dropping points they're not been at the best because they're all focused on Wembley and ending their, their drought. And it's going to be very important for them if they can get that first trophy. It'll be interesting to see what happens to them afterwards. Because we've seen Liverpool in the past, I think under Dalglish, when they won the League Cup in 2012, Granted, they're going in the FA Cup as well. They, they weren't the same after the final because the squad wasn't quite at the strength. For some reason, it can have a knock-on effect negatively once you've won a trophy or once you've been in the final. So Newcastle could use it to inspire them or it could take out of them. And then we see more of them to climb because as good as they've played this season, they have drawn an awful lot of games. They are the team you want to target and take the points off and try and get above. But as much as I've said, Brighton, Fulham and Brentford aren't going to be in there. Tottenham are still in there. Chelsea could still be in there. Like if they get their signings clicking, they're on the exact same place at Dublin, aren't they? Coming from deep, trying to get into the top four. It's a, a still a big ask, like four places when it could be six, seven teams competing for them. And you've potentially got an eighth team if one of these lesser teams show up and don't let go of the fight anytime soon. All you can do is take points off the teams who are in this fight and just keep winning one game at a time. It's, it's very simple. But it's what Liverpool have done before. When they've had to catch up on the top four two, three years ago, just catching up Man City last year. They had to keep winning and put the pressure on. So this is what they've got to do now. And Newcastle is that starting point. If you can get that win to take three points off them, I think they're the only team to beat them so far this season in the Premier League. You know you've got the game in hand. You know that game in hand will technically be cancelled out when they don't play because the League Cup final. But slowly you can close that gap. And then it's just about seeing where it lies come April, May time. You see who else is in the hunt. Liverpool, when they've got that something to prove and they've got a bit of momentum, they're a match for anyone. We've seen that before. The only difference is this year is have they still got that fight? Have they still got the players who can do it? On the basis of Everton, they do. On the basis of everything else we've seen in 2023, they don't. So it's what we see in the next and the weeks ahead. Hopefully they can build on Everton, put Newcastle away and we're, yep, yeah, corner turned. Liverpool, the, uh, the race for Champions League, the hunt for top four starts here. And then off the back of that, maybe a nice uh, summer signing of Jude Bellingham. We'll see. Yeah, it's uh, that that League Cup final coming up for Newcastle. It's it's reminiscent of I, th I think City won the FA Cup. It was back in 2011. It was one of the first things they won under their new ownership. It's got a bit of a a feeling of that if they can win it. Obviously, I think City beat Stoke, so they'll have slightly um, trickier opposition in Manchester United. But we'll finish 
by talking about some of the, the tactics that Newcastle deployed at Anfield when they came and played. Obviously, there was a lot of time wasting, which from the kickoff pretty much obviously came back to bite them in a big way with that Fabio Carvalho late winner coming about a minute and a half after they had a time and finished because I think Nick Pope had laid on the ground for about a minute and a half. Are you expecting to see similar tactics at St. James's Park, Theo? Um, I'd imagine so, because isn't that something that Newcastle have been accused of pretty much all season? Uh, they, they draw a lot of games, that they do, but they keep a lot of clean sheets as well. Like they're, It's not quite 1-0 to the Arsenal territory yet, but that's how you, you're looking at Newcastle at the moment. And it's a shame because you look at the squad and they do have some decent attacking players where you think of, I don't know, Almiron, who's had a great season, uh, St. Maximum, uh, Isaac, if he can hit some form. But at the same time, the squad's not got the depth of a Liverpool. It's not got quite that quality there. They're still on that middle ground trying to make the next step. First trophy will be a step in the direction. Getting in the Champions League will be a step in the direction. But at the same time, it maybe feels like they're running before they can walk. Like if we think of Liverpool's rise back into the Champions League, they, they made it pretty quickly themselves. But they had players who'd been there and done it before, whereas Newcastle aren't quite at that level yet. You think, have a couple of years in the Europa League and then you can get there. But if they get in the Champions League, they've got all that money to go and spend. But then when you've got those quality players, you don't need to sign waste because you just win every single game at home. That's what I mean. Newcastle aren't, yeah, they're, they're still all grind out games. We'll get the odd victory um, and we'll get the points. But it's effective. It's working for them. Like some of the title winning teams of yesteryear, this is how they won titles. It doesn't have to be pretty as long as you get those three points on the board. Newcastle with a bit more quality would have won more games than they've drawn. That's where Liverpool can uh, take advantage of them. It, it is going to be a different atmosphere because you think when they were time wasting at Anfield, the Anfield crowd were very frustrated getting on their backs and maybe they felt that pressure a little bit when the goal comes. And we know how Newcastle uh, so uh, in tune with their supporters. Like St James's Park. Is a horrible place to go when it's behind their team, when for an away team. But then when they're on Newcastle's back, it's a horrible place for the home players to play. At the moment, got Wembley on the sites. They're going to be full of positive to see. They'll be wanting to get a result, no matter how it comes. Clean sheet, gritty. If they get an early goal, if they make a Liverpool make a early mistake or something, as we've seen them do so many times this season. But if Liverpool keep their heads, don't bow down to the pressure and don't get frustrated by the time-wasting, play their own game, and just show us that this season isn't Liverpool. Last year, the year before, or no, that was the bad one, the year before that, they were the good years for Liverpool, and that is the team we're expecting to see. But it's still a big ask. There's so many teams playing for Champions League football now. Um, that, that time waste is what they do. They'll get the clean sheets in so many games, they'll draw so many games. Liverpool just got to show that why they've been the better team than Newcastle for all these years, and why they are the Champions League regulars rather than the saudi back team that have just turned up overnight. Yeah, it seems like um, whatever whatever the result, it's, it's going to be a, a massive game with big implications for that top four race. But that is all we're going to have time for here on the agenda today. So, Theo, thanks for joining me and we'll catch you next time.